It's a pleasure to be speaking in front of this group. Uh, this group is making history in this arena of nanotherapeutics, and uh, we're uh, working with you to apply nanotherapeutics to cardiovascular disease using uh, RNA, uh, our uh, RNA therapeutics. So this has been, uh, for me, it's a culmination of a, a lot of work, and uh, it's exciting to, to be here to talk about it uh, with all of you, and uh, many of you have been participating in the work that I'm going to talk about today, and I'll try to mention uh, your contributions as we go along. But first, the, what we're, we're here to talk about at the moment is the major cause of death and disability in the, uh, in, basically in the, in the world. I was going to say the Western world, but increasingly, even in uh, emerging countries, atherosclerosis is a major cause of death and disability, causing stroke, um, heart attack, uh, aortic aneurysms, uh, renal failure, uh, all of these things uh, are related to this process of atherosclerosis. Well, what is atherosclerosis? The first step in atherosclerosis is adherence of monocytes uh, to the endothelium. So it's an endothelial disorder. It starts with endothelial monocyte interaction. You can see a higher power of view. This is in a, um, uh, uh, the endothelium of the aorta of a rabbit fed a high cholesterol diet. Here uh, you can see in uh, transmission electron microscopy a monocyte adhering to the endothelium. And here a monocyte's been caught in the act of getting in between two endothelial cells. It's on the way to the subintimal space. This process is under the control of endothelial adhesion molecules and chemokines that attract the monocytes to the endothelial surface and allow them to diabetes, diabetes into the subintimal space where they're going after what the body perceives as a foreign antigen, oxidized LDL cholesterol, um, advanced glycosylation end products. So if someone has high cholesterol, they end up accumulating uh, cholesterol in their subintimal space. It becomes oxidized over time, uh, and uh, it becomes a, a seen as non-self and attracts this inflammatory response. Well, once inside the subintimal space, the macrophage do what they're supposed to do, and, and that is to absorb uh, the oxidized LDL cholesterol. But if your cholesterol is not treated, you will continue to bombard the subintimal space with cholesterol and becomes oxidized and these foam cells accumulate more and more lipid and become stuck in that subintimal space where accumulations of these foamy cells, foam cells, macrophage loaded with lipid, accumulations of these foam cells form the first grossly visible lesion in atherosclerosis, which is what you see here. This is a fatty streak. And these lesions are commonly seen in, even in young people. Um, by the time most Western world kids are in their teen years, they, they have these fatty streaks. So that's how the lesion begins, and it grows over time. But it begins with alterations in the endothelium under the influence of oxidized lipid particles and um, advanced glycosylation end products from, uh, in, in diabetes and uh, precipitates this process that's initially an inflammatory process that leads to the accumulation of these foam cells and uh, ultimately um, an, uh, a rather complex plaque. I should mention also that this disease ends as an endothelial dysfunction. It ends as an endothelial dysfunction because what happens in the later stages of the disease is that you get uh, endothelial inflammation, expression of adhesion molecules that allows another wave of monocytes, macrophage to enter, and they start breaking down the fibrous cap overlying this complex lesion, which ruptures. And it's, just, it's like a pustule in the vessel wall rupturing. And that necrotic debris in the uh, atherosclerotic uh, core is highly thrombogenic. It's loaded with tissue factor and causes uh, clotting on contact of the blood. That's what causes most heart attacks. It's not the slow growth of this lesion over time. It's the rupture and the sudden thrombosis that's due to the release of tissue factor in that uh, necrotic core of the atherosclerotic lesion. Well, it begins with the endothelium, something I've been studying for almost 30 years now. This 
is a diaphanous film of tissue. It's only one cell layer thick, but it exerts tremendous control over vessel tone, vessel structure, and interaction of the vessel wall with circulating blood elements. Because the endothelium is not only physically interposed between the blood and the vessel wall, but it secretes paracrine factors that regulate vascular homeostasis. One of those, my favorite, is nitric oxide, a gas made by endothelial cells, NO, um, is a molecule that stimulates soluble guanylate cyclase in the vascular smooth muscle to induce vasodilation. So it was first discovered as a vasodilator, and in 1992, three American scientists won the Nobel Prize for the discovery and characterization of nitric oxide as a vasodilator, but it turns out that it has many other uh, effects on the vessel wall. It inhibits leukocyte adhesion because it prevents the expression of those adhesion molecules and chemokines. It actually prevents lipid peroxidation by reducing the expression of oxidative enzymes. It inhibits platelet adherence and aggregation and smooth muscle cell proliferation in the vessel wall also is in antagonized by nitric oxide. Indeed, nitric oxide, in endothelium-derived nitric oxide is an anti-atherogenic molecule, uh, which is uh, a proposal I made many years ago and is now uh, plenty of evidence uh, to support that uh, hypothesis. Well, in a normal vessel where you have normal blood flow, nice laminar shear stress, that tractive force of fluid flow causes the endothelium to release nitric oxide, which is a good thing, prostacyclin, which is a good thing. Um, it has a lot of other effects, uh, normal laminar flow. Uh, uh, some of those uh, beneficial effects are listed here. Um, but chief among those is the release of nitric oxide to maintain the vessel in a homeostatic state, to cause vasodilation, to prevent things from sticking. At bends, branches, and bifurcations where you have disturbed flow, the, the uh, physicists amongst you, uh, Dr. Ferrari, will recognize that in these branches, you have eddies that allow for recirculation and uh, allow the lipoprotein particles, allow the leukocytes to have more contact with the vessel wall. Um, but in addition, there are biological changes in the endothelium that make it atheroprone, even before there's any evidence of atherosclerosis in a normal cholesterolemic animal. Uh, animal that has normal cholesterol, normal uh, blood sugar, uh, these areas are already atheroprone because they are already expressing less nitric oxide. They're expressing more uh, free uh, oxygen-derived uh, free radicals and adhesion molecules and chemokines. So these areas are atheroprone. And indeed, this is where we see lesions develop in our patients. It's at the bends, branches, and bifurcations of blood vessels that lesions tend to form. Well, the other thing that's interesting that happens in atherosclerosis at these bends, branches, and bifurcations is something I like to call focal senescence. Um, Chang and Hurley discovered this um, back uh, in 1995 that at, at these bends, branches, and bifurcations, endothelial cells are turning over faster. They're becoming senescent faster. So normally endothelial cells are lined with flow. They, they make a lot of nitric oxide and prostacyclin. And, but when they get older, and at these, particularly these bends, branches, and bifurcations, they assume more of a cobblestone morphology. And uh, these cells are abnormal. Um, they, they're not aligned with flow. Uh, they're expressing adhesion molecules and chemokines and reactive oxygen species and less nitric oxide. Monocytes tend to stick here. So this is the biological explanation for why lesions tend to occur at bends, branches, and bifurcations. So endothelial senescence is a risk factor for atherosclerosis. And certainly aging, is a, as you all know, is a risk factor for atherosclerosis. But it's particularly at these sites of accelerated sen senescence, focal senescence, at the bends, branches, and bifurcations. Well, one of the things Chang and Hurley observed in that study was that the telomeres were actually shorter in the endothelial cells, in the human aortic bifurcation. So this is not animal studies. These are, these are patients that have uh, uh, succumbed to their disease, uh, uh, whatever it might be. Um, and uh, those individuals at the at Ben's branches of bifurcations, uh, you find that the endothelial cells are senescent. They're, 
Their, their turnover is faster um, and uh, their telomeres are shorter. So telomere erosion is a determinant of aging. And these three uh, American scientists won the Nobel Prize for their characterization of the telomere and telomerase, the enzyme that restores telomeres. So somatic cells actually don't have this enzyme, uh, telomerase. And at the, um, at the, uh, after, with each cell division, um, the telomere, which is kind of the protective cap on the end of every chromosome, becomes shorter with each cell division. A telomere in a, a normal human, uh, young human, uh, is about 8 to 10 kilobases. It becomes shorter with each uh, cell division. And at some point, it becomes so short that it triggers a DNA injury response, and the cell becomes senescent. Um, so um, we wondered uh, years ago, because of what I told you about endothelial senescence, we wondered years ago if we could reverse endothelial senescence with um, restoration of telomerase activity. Could we um, restore telomere length in endothelial cells and rejuvenate them? So could we convert them from, uh, from uh, um, an older, uh, senescent uh, endothelial morphology to, to cells like this that would align with shear stress and make nitric oxide and, and uh, resist uh, inflammation, resist monocyte adhesion? Well, the answer to that is yes. So working with Giron, um, we, we showed that um, um, HTERT, um, uh, retroviral HTERT, could in fact restore endothelial health. Now, this is expression of endothelial NOS. That's one marker of uh, youth in an endothelial cell. And with um, shear stress, the production of ENOS goes up. The cells make more nitric oxide. That's a good thing. But in the now, parental is a little bit misleading because in this case, it means these are the precursors of these cells, which were aged in cell culture. So the senescent cells aged uh, passage many times in cell culture uh, made less nitric oxide, uh, and uh, they responded less to shear stress. But we could take senescent endothelial cells and expose them to the retroviral HTERT, um, and we showed, in fact, that that increased telomere uh, length uh, re reverse the telomere erosion and enhance nitric oxide production. And you can see the, just the flip side of that with adherence of monocytes. So uh, adherence of monocyte goes up in the senescent endothelial cells, goes down with the HTERT treatment. So yes, we could restore endothelial cells. We went on to characterize these endothelial cells in many different ways. We looked at the, their ability to respond to shear stress, their ability to, to function in many different ways. And those functions were restored simply by uh, extending the, re extending the telomere. So the telomere is a very important determinant of, of age. Now, um, the problem with um, this approach that we used was we had an integrating approach. We took a retroviral age turt and we integrated into the endothelial cells. We essentially immortalized them. Now, um, would telomerase RNA be a better approach? Well, yes, because if it works, if, you could, if, it, if it actually worked, it would be a better approach because uh, RNA telomerase is not going to integrate into the cell. It's not going to immortalize the cell with all of the concerns about cell immortalization, cancer, et cetera. And um, if, it, if we could make it work, um, it wouldn't alter the cell genome, and we would have something that would um, uh, be potentially a therapeutic. But, there wasn't really any reason to believe that one or two or three transfections with RNA would have any effect at all, really. It was a bit of a leap to think that we could do this with RNA, because RNA only persists in the cell for, for hours. Now, the, 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 the protein that's made from that transcript is going to last longer, but we've shown maybe 24, 48 hours. Uh, by 72 hours, the telomerase that has been generated using RNA is gone. So there wasn't any reason to believe that you, we would have an effect. But uh, in fact, we did the, 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 the studies um, at Stanford. And this was more, more recently, just published last, uh, last year in FASA. In fact, this approach works. It works more dramatically than we had anticipated. So now these aren't endothelial cells. These are human fibroblasts. And uh, what I'm showing you is uh, the uh, population doublings over time as the fibroblasts approach the hay flick limit. So the hay flick limit for fibroblasts, human fibroblasts, is about 50 population doublings. 
And uh, with one, two, or three treatments, you can see that we got a significant boost in replicative capacity, one, two, or three treatments. And even after these cells plateaued, again, at a much higher level, 80 population doublings, we could hit them with the telomerase, RNA telomerase again and get further doubling. So that was very exciting, unexpected, and uh, it led to intellectual property. Um, and uh, one thing that we, uh, that we don't show in this slide is the endothelial cells. The endothelial cells, we, we didn't understand at the time, but the endothelial cells didn't respond quite as well. We got a benefit. Now we actually have a much better understanding of why some cells are more responsive to telomerase than other types of cells, but that's uh, uh, intellectual property that I can't talk about today. But uh, we have learned that uh, fibroblasts are the champs in terms of responding to telomerase, uh, but uh, other cells can also, uh, with the right uh, approaches, can also respond to RNA telomerase. And there's a lot of opportunity here for uh, rejuvenating cells. The, the low hanging fruit for us with this telomerase approach is uh, cell therapy ex vivo, modification of cells ex vivo, so uh, improving cell therapies. Any cell therapy could potentially be improved by telomerase by improving the ability of those somatic cells to replicate. Um, now, with respect to the topic today, um, we focused on these children with progeria because these children have accelerated aging and these children die from atherosclerotic vascular disease. So we chose to study these individuals because there's a real need for new therapies for these kids and uh, because it's an accelerated disorder where we might be able to see the impact of this anti-aging therapy in a relatively short period of time. Um, so this is Leslie Gordon with her son, Sam, who uh, unfortunately had progeria. And she formed the Progeria Foundation when, after uh, uh, his diagnosis was made at the age of two. And uh, she's been uh, the international leader in organizing clinical trials uh, for this uh, disorder. Uh, these are some of the children with progeria. You can see that these kids, um, and, and 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, look like they're 60, 70, 80 years old, um, they have uh, loss of subcutaneous adipose tissue, uh, they have some bony erosions uh, and uh, osteoporosis, but what uh, these children succumb to is their uh, vascular disease, their heart and vascular disease. Um, interestingly, uh, these kids' brains are not affected. This is more of a mesodermal aging. The brains, the neuroectoderm is not affected so much, in fact, at all. Uh, these kids are like, uh, have the joie de vivre of children, the ebullience, they want to play, uh, and it's ironic because they're trapped in these 80-year-old um, bodies. Um, this is what their coronary arteries look like. Now, most of you may not be used to looking at coronary arteries uh, that are diseased, but these are heavily diseased coronary arteries from these children. This is what uh, the, uh, an unhealthy 70, 80-year-old uh, person uh, might look like with respect to the uh, coronary arteries. So they get a tremendous um, uh, atherosclerosis. It's a little bit different than uh, garden variety atherosclerosis in that there's a little bit more loss of the media. Uh, but otherwise, it's fairly similar to uh, the atherosclerosis that we see in our older patients. Now, the disease is due to a mutation in a nuclear lamin uh, protein. It's a, this is a laminopathy. Lamin A is uh, mutated. There's a, a, a mutation of a splice site for uh, Farnesyl. And um, as, a, as a result, the abnormal lamin, which is called progerin, uh, becomes farnesylated which is normal, lamin A becomes farnesylated, migrates to the nuclear envelope. The farnesyl group is supposed to be cleaved at that point, but in these kids with the mutation, the farnesyl group can't be cleaved, the progerin gets stuck to the nuclear envelope and causes these um, odd-looking um, nuclei, lobulated nuclei, and uh, a, a general distortion of nuclear architecture and changes in gene expression that are associated with aging, including telomere erosion. So telomere erosion is a condition that these uh, uh, kids have. Uh, and uh, this, we thought, might be, although it's secondary, it might be a major cause of the aging. So we 
investigated uh, the, the hypothesis. This is Timo Nazari and Yanwi Li, uh, who investigated the hy hypothesis, could RNA telomerase um, in, uh, overexpression of H. tert, could that improve the cell phenotype? Now, the cells from these children uh, behave as uh, senescent uh, cells. These are fibroblasts derived from these children. Um, and uh, what Yanwei Li is showing you here is that these cells uh, are very uh, different from normal healthy fibroblasts in that they don't proliferate very well at all. Um, this is a number of cells over time. And you can see uh, she has great difficulty. I think she started with 25,000 cells, and she has great difficulty in getting any more cells over time. They kind of, after uh, several months, they get back to 25,000. But um, the um, uh, cells that are treated with H. tert uh, have a tremendous uh, response. Uh, so this looks very promising. In addition, there are markers of senescence that we can observe in these cells. And these markers are going down uh, dramatically uh, with H. tert treatment. I, I should mention CI H. tert is catalytically inactive H. tert. It's a mutated H. tert uh, where the uh, uh, telomerase uh, uh, activity is, is, is uh, uh, destroyed by a site mutation, but otherwise the, the protein is normal. Uh, so it's a nice control, uh, H-TERT uh, improving the, um, uh, uh, reducing uh, uh, beta-gal expression, which is a marker of senescence. We also looked at other things like inflammatory cytokines, which were reduced. And um, uh, so um, uh, very exciting data from Jan. We, this is kind of a summary right now of what we have that the H-TERT mRNA in the progeria fibroblast uh, increases telomere length. We've measured that. Promotes cell proliferation. I've shown you that. Reduces senescence markers. And it's synergistic with the only drug that's approved for these kids, alanafarnib, which is a farnesyl transferase inhibitor. Now, this is promising. But what's next? We, if we really want to take this to the clinic, we have to generate clinical grade RNA that we can actually take to the clinic. And we have to deliver it systemically to these children. So that's what we have to do next. If we really want to do what Dr. Ferrari has asked us to do, which is to take our fundamental insights and translate them into something useful. If we really want to do that. Now, I should tell you that um, we have a cheerleader uh, for us uh, on the sidelines. Um, uh, Dr. Gordon, who I introduced you to earlier, uh, is very excited about our data. We've shown it to her. She wants us to go for it. She wants us to look now into an animal model and uh, see if we can, in an animal model of progeria, uh, and there are several, uh, she wants us to see if we can uh, get a proof of concept in uh, preclinical studies. So uh, that's also another step. Anyway, where are we? Where are we now? Um, this is Yvonne Bruno with Colleen Fisher. Uh, uh, Dr. Bruno directs the um, RNA core, and she has done a dramatic job with her team uh, in moving us from a little um, research shop uh, into a GMP manufacturer of RNA therapeutics. So we, we, I, we started making RNA constructs for the stem cell community back at Stanford in 2011, but now we're actually uh, generating uh, GMP grade uh, material and getting ready for um, clinical trials. Some, the, the, probably the first clinical trials will be industry sponsored, uh, but uh, ultimately we'll get uh, our own products as well. What you see here is where the, the CGMP RNA synthesis takes place up on the 14th floor in this building. The plasma generation is on the 11th floor, and we make our research constructs on the 10th floor. And you see some of the uh, work going on there in this slide. We've got the robotics for the IVT RNA synthesis and a bioreactor for the application of the uh, plasmid constructs. You see the uh, clean rooms there, and also Roman Sukoverson, who's uh, developed um, novel approaches to purify the RNA. That turned out to be really, really important because there are impurities generated in the RNA, and he's developed methods to, um, to remove them. And um, uh, Andrea Bala has uh, uh, developed methods to detect those impurities. Um, so now, we have to, now that we have the material, the clinical grade RNA, we're going to have to deliver it to these children. And today, if you went to the poster session, you saw some very exciting work 
being carried out uh, by our nano colleagues who are developing methods for us to get this product to the clinic. And um, the, uh, let me just introduce you to a little bit of the work that we've done, but please drop by the posters and see for yourself. Um, this gentleman uh, is Timo Nazari Sharif, and Timo was uh, interested to see if we could improve, if we could deliver the RNA with exosomes that we, uh, endogenous exosomes that we harvested from the patients. So what are exosomes? Exosomes are microparticles, um, microvesicles uh, that are budding off the cell membrane or exosomes that are being generated from uh, the um, uh, ER uh, uh, endosomes. And this is actually proof of concept that a, a nanoparticle delivery or micro vesicle delivery could actually work because, in fact, this is an endogenous form of cellular communication for RNA. So RNA, microRNA, message RNA, proteins, lipids are packaged in these exosomes and microvesicles normally. This is going on all the time in our bodies. It's another form of endocrine communication between cells. Uh, so why not um, harvest these endosomes from our, our patients, or exosomes from our patients, and use those uh, to, uh, to deliver our RNA. Well, it's a good idea, right, um, because it's the use of an endogenous system, but one of the problems we had, and, and we're never really able to resolve, and maybe we should have got our nano colleagues more involved in this, is the stability of the exosomes was problematic. We, we couldn't maintain the stability of the exosomes. They would merge with each other, and the other problem with the exosomes is they're dirty. They already have microRNA and message RNA and proteins and lipids. So um, ultimately, uh, we, we decided to look at uh, other approaches that our uh, uh, nano colleagues were offering us. And um, um, uh, Dr. Molinaro uh, gave me uh, this, uh, some, uh, these nice slides. Thank you, uh, Roberto, um, regarding the leukocyte-inspired biomimetic particles. And, uh, uh, Dr. Boda, Malnaro, and Sukoverson have been working on using uh, this approach as a form of vascular delivery. At the moment, I have to tell you that the, the results of which you can see, uh, Dr. Boda was showing those today, um, uh, we still have a way, ways to go. It's suboptimal because we don't get the uh, um, uh, amount of delivery of the RNA uh, that we need to to the vessel wall. And there's a fair amount that doesn't get to the vessel. It goes, as you probably know, in the reticulum endothelial system. You're going to hear, I think, tomorrow from Hisham Faneri about uh, another approach, uh, the DNA nanotubes. Um, Hisham Faneri is uh, up, pictured up on the right there, and uh, Yvonne Bruno on the left, uh, the director of the RNA Corps, who I already uh, introduced you to. And they got funding from Costas to investigate the use of these DNA nanotubes uh, for delivery of RNA. I never thought this was going to work. <laughs> I really didn't. I thought this would be highly uh, toxic. I thought it would activate innate immunity. It doesn't seem to. It doesn't seem to activate innate immunity. We have to do more work. But um, uh, Yvonne is very bullish on the DNA nanotubes. They don't seem to have much toxicity in vitro. Uh, so we're, we're going to be working with Hisham a little bit more on the DNA, DNA nanotubes. He's going to be talking about this tomorrow. And finally, um, uh, working with uh, uh, Amaro and Haifa Shen and Elvin Blanco on um, nanoporous silicon carriers, uh, uh, loading those with lipid RNA nanoparticles. And uh, they just had a beautiful paper in Nature Biotechnology showing the utility of these particles for delivering um, uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents to uh, lung cancer. So we're interested to, to work with, it, with them, and we're making some progress, and there's a poster uh, uh, detailing the progress uh, so far in atherosclerosis. So a um, lot more detail on the posters. Um, I have to conclude. My time is up, but I just want to s finish by saying atherosclerosis begins as an endothelial dysfunction. And I think that if we can restore endothelial health, and there's many ways to restore endothelial health. We can talk about them at a coffee break. Um, but uh, RNA nanotherapeutics may be one such approach uh, for these children with progeria and ultimately for all of us. Thank you.